Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to have another short lecture about a new parallel pattern, convolution. Remember that in this course, we have already covered a couple of parallel patterns. The first one was the reduction operation, an operation that reduces a set of values to a single value. And it has this operation needs to have certain properties like associativity, commutativity, and identity value. Then we talk about uh, how to map these nicely onto a GPU and how to, uh, pro uh, on how to implement it without divergence-free mapping. In the next lecture, the past lecture, we talk about histogram computation. Histograms are frequently used um, for reducing the dimensionality and exactly notable features and in the in large input data sets. And the basic idea in a histogram is that we check the value, each, each possible input value, and then we um, uh, update uh, one being in the histogram, we uh, uh, add, we increment the counter associated to each being of the histogram, depending on what's the value of the input. Remember that uh, for histogram calculation, we need to use atomic operations and atomic operations serialize the execution. And one way of optimizing um, atomic, uh, the, the use of atomic operations is privatization, a technique that in the case of the histogram places different subhistograms for each each of the thread blocks in the case of the GPUs, these different subhistograms are calculated in parallel and finally reduced altogether. Today, we are going to talk about another important parallel pattern that is convolution. Convolution has many applications. It's a widely used operation in signal processing, image processing, video processing, and computer vision. And basically, convolution applies a filter or a mask, also sometimes called a kernel. But here in this course, we are going to about this term kernel because it can be confused with CUDA or GPU kernels. So the idea, as I said, is to apply this filter or mask on each element of the input that can be a signal, an image, or a frame of a video to obtain a new value, which is a weighted sum of a set of neighboring input elements. And this is useful in image processing for smoothing, sharpening, or blurring an image, or finding it in an image, or removing noise. These days, uh, convolutions are also very much used in machine learning and artificial intelligence, especially as convolutional layers in convolutional, convolutional neural networks or CNNs or ConvNets. Let's start simple. Let's start with a 1D convolution example that is commonly using audio processing. Here we have our input. Imagine that this is an audio record composed by many consecutive elements. And we have a mask that we are going to apply. The mask is usually an odd number of elements, has usually an odd number of elements. And in this case, in this example, is five. So in order to calculate one of these elements, for example, the element P2 of the output, Put, we need to put the mask on top of the, uh, center the mask on top of the element for which we want to calculate the, out the output. We perform partial products, element-wise multiplication. This uh, three multiplies this one, this four multiplies this uh, two, and the partial products are later reduced and the resulting uh, the value, 57 in this case, is stored in the corresponding uh, element of the output. When using, when computing convolutions, it's important to pay attention to the boundary conditions. Why is that? Because we, if we are um, uh, computing the output for elements that are near the boundary, we might go outside of the actual input array. And so we need to deal with these ghost elements. And there are different policies on how to deal with these ghost elements. Uh, one possibility is to uh, consider that they are zero as uh, is the case in this example, or replicate boundary values uh, or uh, other approaches. So in this case, we basically do the same. We would be uh, multiplying these three of the mask with the cost zero. So the partial product is zero. Then we perform the final reduction and obtain the output. This is 38 in this case. Here you can see a simple 1D convolutional kernel with a boundary condition. Um, there is a one index uh, for uh, each uh, element of the output, each of them assigned to a different thread. And um, we need to compute the address of the first neighbor and then uh, go one by one over all the elements uh, uh, of the over the, the number of elements that the mask has 
checking the boundaries in order to not go outside of the boundaries of the input array, but then performing the uh, partial multiplication with the uh, corresponding element of the mask and the element of the input array and the accumulation in this p-value uh, array, that uh, p-value um, variable that will be in a, in a uh, register and finally store the output onto the uh, corresponding element of the output array. Uh, remember that the memory in the GPU architecture, and then remember that one of the memory spaces in the GPU memory hierarchy is the constant memory, and this constant memory is cached. There is a, a, a specific cache space inside each uh, GPU core that is called the constant cache, and in this case, this constant cache can be very useful to uh, store the mask because the mask in the end is constant. It doesn't change, and it's going to be useful to many things threads running uh, on the uh, same SM or on the same uh, GPU core. So we can store the mask in the constant memory for several reasons. First of all, because it's constant, also because it's small, and also because it's accessed by all threads. And uh, the good thing of the constant memory is that it is cached inside each GPU core, and that's why it's uh, fast, and it's particularly fast when all threads of a warp access the same value. And that's actually what's going to happen when we uh, execute the code for the kernel for the uh, convolution. So the, what we need to do to use the constant memory is to declare the mask as a global variable with the corresponding constant qualifier, and then initialize the mask from the host. This is done by using this uh, CUDA and copy to symbol where where we have the destination, that is the address of the mask in the uh, GPU memory, the source or the address of the mask in the CPU memory, and the corresponding size of the mask. And here you can see the code <clears throat> with boundary condition handling and constant cache for uh, M. The code itself, the kernel code itself, is basically the same as we saw before. The key difference is that now the mask is in the constant memory. Um, however, we have to use this with caution. And the reason is that the constant cache is small. So it's typically 64 kilobytes. So uh, we cannot try to fit something that is much larger than that, um, especially because in that case, we are not going to have the advantage of the data being cached. Um, the, remember that in this course, we have uh, already discussed tiling or blocking as a technique to take advantage of data reuse. We talk about uh, tiling in shared memory. This is uh, the, the, an example of uh, tiling for an image where we are applying a Gaussian filter. These ideal type of tiling for sure can be applied as well to convolution. And for example, in the case of the one key, uh, 1D convolution, where we basically partition the input uh, and the output uh, uh, across the multiple thread blocks that are going to uh, run this computation. So there are different tiles. These tiles can be in the shared memory, can be on chip, uh, including the hollows, including these boundaries that we need to compute the corresponding uh, element those for the, corresponding, the outputs for those elements that are close to the uh, boundaries. These are the hollows. And uh, the first thing that we will have to do is load in the, the necessary part, the tile itself uh, of the input into the uh, shared memory. And to do so, we have to, I mean, here you have three consecutive slides explaining how to load first the left hollow, then how to load the uh, elements in the middle, and then how to load the right hollow, doing the corresponding address calculation and checking the boundaries in order to not go uh, beyond the part of the input that we really need. I will leave this here for your own study. This slide is about the uh, how to load the left hollow into the shared memory. These are the uh, internal elements uh, of the uh, of the tile itself, and this part here is for the right hollow. And this is the entire kernel for the tile 1D convolution. As you can see, first of all, uh, obtaining the index of the output element that is related to the 
um, uh, block ID, block dimensions, and the thread ID of the uh, uh, of the corresponding thread that is going to compute uh, each element of the output. Here we declare the share memory tile. In this part here, we load the left hollow into the share memory, then load the internal elements, then load the right hollow, synchronize in order to make sure that everything, all the tile, the entire tile is in the um, uh, shared memory, and after that, performing calculating the convolution result using the uh, data previously stored in the shared memory and the uh, mask uh, that will likely will be in the constant memory, as we said earlier. Uh, tiling is also uh, very useful in 2D convolution, and we have uh, discussed this. Uh, I mean, this uh, specific example of the Gaussian filtering. We already mentioned it in a in a previous uh, lecture. And this tiling in 2D uh, convolution is especially useful in the convolutions that are done in machine learning. Convolutions, by the way, in machine learning are pretty useful, uh, even though they are having traditionally used for feature detection in image processing. They can also be used as neural network layers, as we mentioned already, and they have some inner advantages over other types of layers, like fully connected layers that we can find in multi-layer perception. Uh, the one reason is that they use uh, only local weights because they don't need to access um, weights from uh, the whole image, but just a concrete part of the image, uh, because they compute only a window around the element of interest, as we have seen uh, in the um, in the previous examples of convolution. And the good thing is that because the, these uh, weights, these uh, total weights that need to be used are relatively small, this mask is relatively small, it can easily fit in on chip memories. That's why tiling techniques are being uh, uh, pretty much useful here, uh, either in shared memory or in constant memory, as uh, we have also seen. And here you can see another example of the 2D convolution, basically placing the filter or placing the mask on top of the uh, input uh, element. In, in the case of, a, of a, um, a CNN, this could be the input feature map. We compute partial products. We perform the final reduction and obtain the element uh, in the output layer. And here the code is incomplete, but you can uh, see a, a simplified uh, basic convolution layer forward kernel uh, the, first of all uh, obtain the indices of the output feature map and then uh, sum over all input channels and here uh, we loop over the k by k filter performing the multiplication and accumulation operation and in the end uh, obtaining one value that goes to the output feature map uh, convolutions can be very efficiently executed in GPUs, but especially uh, efficient if they are uh, converted into matrix multiplications because they are uh, compute intensive parts and GPUs are very well optimized for matrix multiplication. And we already know some of the tiling techniques for matrix multiplication. We have explained uh, how to do tiling in shared memory in a previous lecture. So this idea of converting convolutions of a convolutional layer into a matrix multiplication can help to accelerate the execution and also helps to keep the level of parallel and stable across CNN layers. We will talk in more detail about this in the next lecture, but here you can see a, a very simple example of how to uh, uh, turn one convolutional layer into a matrix multiplication. Basically, uh, we need to unroll the input features and unroll the convolutional filters and place them uh, in the shape of a matrix. If you take a look at this uh, row of the of this um, uh, of this um, matrix here, uh, you can see that these four elements here correspond to the first of these filters. These four elements here correspond to the next filter, and so on and so forth. And regarding the input features, uh, the unroll input features, as you see, what we are doing is uh, taking windows of the uh, corresponding input feature map and uh, unrolling this. So this 1, 2, 1, 1 is 1, 2, 1, 1 that we see here. And next to them in the next column, we have the same corresponding window in the next uh, input feature map. 
So this way we can compute the uh, convolutional layer with the matrix multiplication, make it more efficient and, 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 and higher performance and on GPUs. We will talk in more detail in the next lecture about how to do so. Uh, these uh, matrix, matrix multiplications can also take advantage of the GPU tensor cores that you know uh, exist in GPUs since the Volta architecture. Uh, here in this slide, you see the um, some details about the tensor cores in the more recent H100 architecture. Um, these tensor core operations are uh, extremely efficient, highly optimized for matrix matrix multiplication. In the long version of this lecture, you can uh, see a few slides, uh, some explanations about how to use these tensor cores, how to uh, program them in a, a relatively um, high level. Uh, view. And so if you are interested, uh, you can take a look at the longer version of this lecture. And of course, you can also take a look at these chapters in the uh, book Programming uh, Massively Parallel Processors. And here you can see the link to the uh, longer version of this lecture. So this is all for today. I hope that you found this uh, short lecture interesting, and I hope to see you in the next lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Thank you very much for your attention.